Welcome to Emma Labs Live, a podcast by Neptune AI. We host in-depth discussions where machine learning practitioners answer questions from other practitioners about one subject related to production machine learning and MLOps. Tune in to get real-life stories, dirty hacks, and pragmatic workarounds from ML people in the trenches. Hello, everybody, and welcome to MLOps Live. This is the first ever episode. My name is Sabine, and I'm joined by my co-host, Steven. So this is an interactive Q&A session with uh, our guest today, who's an expert in the topic of today, which is building a visual search engine. So to participate and ask uh, questions, you can use the raise your hand function in Zoom to let us know you'd like to ask a question and we will unmute you and you can just go ahead and ask right here uh, live. We'll also be monitoring any chats so you can type your questions there as well. And if there's time, we will uh, go over community questions submitted in advance. So to get started, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our first ever guest, machine learning and data science engineer, Jakub uh, Cieslik. So welcome, Jakub. And would you like to introduce yourself with uh, just a few words? Sure. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, it's nice to uh, uh, to participate in this event. Uh, yeah, I'm a machine learning engineer with uh, um, like some years of experience and uh, in building an ML products and ML ML solutions. And uh, as it happens, the last uh, like uh, one on one or two years, I specialized in building uh, visual search solutions and uh, in general. Uh, computer vision is uh, is uh, my major uh, topic of interest in this in this field. So, yeah. So, what kinds of uh, things are you working on right now? So, currently, uh, I'm working on a pretty uh, interesting uh, interesting topic. At least, uh, it uh, spikes some uh, interest every whenever I when I whenever I uh, tell it to people. So, I'm working on. Um, fa face ID for animals, essentially. So you have, uh, you can imagine you uh, uh, using your phone, and it recognizes you. Uh, you know, all the uh, you know uh, mobile phones now have this kind of functionality that they can recognize you based uh, based on uh, the camera feed. Or the uh, or the face uh, face uh, camera, and the, essentially a similar thing we are trying to build for for animals, where tracking animals becomes uh, more important. There are certain uh, situations where uh, where using other means of technology like uh, NFC tags, uh, writing down uh, you know whatever uh, is is being used now. It's not practical uh, for whatever reason, and we have the technology now, or we hope to uh, to advance this technology to the level that uh, we will be able to identify animals on an individual level um, from uh, from a single or multiple pictures. All right, very cool. So, not to like put you on the spot here, but. Uh, we would love to hear you explain vis visual search in in one minute, if possible. I'll throw you a bit of a challenge. Yeah. So for me, uh, I would think of this problem as uh, you know any search problem, right? So when whenever we think about searching something, we want to retrieve uh, relevant information for us, right? And and usually that's done via text, at least that's how we uh, used to it, uh, how we got used to it. But essentially, like visual search is just a some subset of this problem, which uses a specifically a uh, visual uh, information. So it can be a video, it can be, you know, an image, it can be a drawing, whatever it might be that is visually, uh, uh, you know, for humans, it's a visual thing. So that's, uh, that's, pretty much uh, pretty much the problem 
All right. I think that did fit inside one minute. So good job there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting, uh, Kuba, your, your idea on uh, visual search and search engines. And I, I would just go at a high level. What are some of the examples of you know, visual search engines uh, you, know, you see around to, today that people typically use and they don't know what the, what the technology behind it is? Yeah, so I think like this technology kind of uh, starts popping up more and more now. Like, and it also gets better. So, for instance, I think like the, the prime example of uh, uh, of this technology and uh, uh, w- that gives uh, amazing results is actually Google Lens, right? Which is the right. the most uh, used and probably uh, most uh, advanced technology for that. And of course, it's uh, it becomes uh, it's a very important like uh, kind of sales uh, uh, way and marketing way, right? So you uh, you essentially can point at anything and take a picture right. of it, and Google will try to find uh, find it and redirect you to places usually where you can buy them. And that's of course um, you know the, the, a very a very important reason why why this is uh, uh, why this is developed. Right. Uh, but there are other things, right? So there's uh, definitely all those visual search engines. Pinterest is very good at this uh, also, where you essentially, like, they build the product around um, this immersive uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, feeling of just going and just looking. You, know, you don't have to type much. You, don't, you only have to click whatever you, it is appealing to you. And right. then, uh, and then it tries to, uh, you know, suggest you things that you might want because in the end, it's very, uh, like the intent is very, uh, uh very tricky. Like w- when you search with an image, it's very hard to, to get the intent. Like, are you looking, uh, you know, are you interested in patterns? You're interested in this object itself or maybe in something completely different, right? So usually like, in order to make good, um, you know, good searches with uh, uh, visual searches, you also need some context of what the user wants. Mm, so yeah, I would say that. Um, but of course, like other things uh, that uh, that are kind of on the, on the other spectrum, like facial identification, they are completely different, right? There you essentially have only one valid uh, answer you have a, a, a verification or identification problem and this technology you know lies on another spectrum of of the problem but the technology that is uh, used to solve it is actually you know quite uh, quite similar mm. yeah okay and and still at the high level again uh, do i think about visual search engines i think of them more like a combination of different technologies and that could be like OCR technology, that could be, you know, other technologies. So, you know, am I wrong in thinking this way or, you know, what are like the different technologies that can actually make up a visual search engine? So I'm not sure if I, if I get what you mean, but I think in, in terms of like, uh, in terms of like combining multiple things, uh, then often what you, what you want is actually, uh, actually, uh, like use multimodal information, right? So you you use also text uh, that is, uh, you know, provided, and this is the context information, and then search, uh, and then the visual part um, part uh, itself. Okay. But I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe you can elaborate more on the okay on the question. Yeah. What I mean, like for example, Google Lens. Let's take taking Google Lens into account. Uh, I, I, when I think of Google Lens as a beginner, of course, I would see Google Lens as some OCR type of technology happening in the background. So do we say like for to build a proper visual search engine, there has to be like OCR tech in there and then there has to be some, you know, some other visual tech in there or what's that, what's that, uh, what's that process about? So I don't, I think like OCR is important uh, to many okay. uh, solutions, for instance, uh, I'm, I, I don't know, maybe some of you know, like, like, like there's an app called uh, Vivino for wine uh, label scanning, right? So, and you could do this both ways, right? So you could, sir, you could probably solve this problem of matching like a, 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 a bottle of wine with the actual bottle uh, that you want to find. You could uh, help yourself with OCR technology. So actually reading the text that is on right. the, on the bottle and that's, could help you, right? It probably would if there is some text, 
But of course, there are labels without text and and having like a combined um, solution or fallback uh, solutions uh, is quite uh, yeah quite quite important um, most of the time. So that's what I said that when when I said that it's rarely a purely uh, visual problem. Uh, usually, it's like a visual plus something problem uh, okay. in most of the cases, uh, which are not like those uh, you know. Um, identification verification problems where you actually don't have any other context and um, yeah all right so just just to be clear uh, what distinguishes that visual search tech from like the OCR tech is the context just understanding the context around um, the the image is it yeah well to okay. uh, to actually look at the image because <laughs> like OCR right. is just uh, you know used for uh, actually finding text right finding right. Mm -hmm. finding text and then trying to do something with text. So we, when we, uh, when we train models to do uh, visual understanding um, of uh, net uh, networks that do, do visual understanding, we, uh, you know, want um, more than that. We want to mm -hmm. find features, find, uh, you know, mm, connections in the images that are not that right. clearly, uh, you, you, it's not possible to describe them with text also. Mm -hmm. Right. And but more more importantly, we don't have text for most of the images we uh, we have in the world, right? So, yeah, exactly. All right. Thanks. That would be the sure. So we have in chat a question from Lev who would like to know how Jakub feels. Uh, Bing's visual search matches up with Google Lens, if you're familiar with it. Yeah, that's a good question. Honestly, uh, uh, don't know. I think uh, uh, didn't use Bing for for a while, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the Google one is for sure certainly uh, quite good. Like, it's it's actually amazing. But like recently, I I, I was actually trying to find a um, uh, a chair. I think in a hotel that that I really liked, and it was just spot on uh, the first uh, first try. So. Out of all the chairs in the world, I think that's that's impressive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we have a, a room for a question from the community. Uh, so th this is new to me, uh, these triplet uh, networks. Uh, what is your go-to baseline triplet network training repo? What and what might one uh, want to look out for when using it? Yeah, so uh, hmm, so triplet uh, uh, so, uh, so triplet learning is a special type of uh, you know uh, metric learning. It's part of uh, uh, part of metric learning where we uh, where we try to um, learn uh, a metric function, and this uh, usually goes by the means of like comparing comparing two things. For so, for instance, for faces, we could train such models that you show a network like one. Uh, mm, two pictures of the same person and uh, a third pic picture of another person, and then uh, a, a model that will learn to uh, to keep close uh, the uh, the images in some space of the same person, and uh, you know push it for uh, further from the other ones. And there's actually a lot of good uh, good frameworks for that. And uh, the one that came to my mind uh, is, um, in, 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 especially in PyTorch, which I use the most, is uh, PyTorch metric, metric learning with dashes in, in between. And um, and yeah, it, 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 it actually implements um, most of the novel uh, novelties and the new, uh, new solutions that uh, you might, um, and new papers or new, uh, loss functions, whatever uh, you, you want, and um, mm, and yeah, I really recommend it. It's uh, it's it's quite good. Uh, maybe we add you know a, a link to it uh, later on, uh -huh. but mm, yeah, that would be the. So, do you have any uh, tips for setting that up for visual search, like a, a checklist or something? Yeah, checklist. I think I would really s figure out like what what the, the 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 problem really is, right? And what uh, you know what uh, what is being solved and how to set it up. Because some some uh, some uh, some things we might want to learn from 
uh, from learning, like a triplet learning um, network, some things we might need uh, to learn from, um, you know, in a pure unsupervised fashion or from my ranking, uh, uh, ranking labels. Uh, so I think in the end, it, it boils down to the problem to, to like learn meaningful features, right? Meaningful features from, um, uh, from images and what those features actually should be. Uh, because that's very problem problem specific, right? Because if you think about, you know, a lot of the times like search engines are being showed like, yeah, just pass pass some images through a, a pre-trained network, and then um, you know the 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 features coming out of it, uh, you know, will cluster this data somehow. And that's true, but it, if it will cluster it the way you think it it should be, is another story, right? So, for instance. If you're, if the network was trained on, um, you know, 1,000 classes, that it means that it is pretty good in grouping uh, different types of objects, but it will not be pretty good in distinguishing them. So a network, to, uh, a model that use is pre-trained might be not might not be the greatest one, for instance, to rank uh, or find similar dresses, uh, so to say, because it never understood like really the concept of different types of dresses it might have uh, it might you know be still be quite useful but most of the time this type of um, you know additional information that we want to gain from it is uh, needs to uh, needs new data and or or you know additional labels at least uh, so um, so that's uh, that's the that's the tricky part, and uh, that would be the, you know, main main consideration. But of course, we, if we would know more about a certain problem, then then you know, then you can think about setting, uh, you know, setting everything up. Uh, so, um, Kuba is asking, but you'd still fine tune the pre-trained on new data, right? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I mean, um, using a pre-trained network is, uh, you know, always, uh, almost always the 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 way to go, right? Instead of going um, going from uh, from scratch. Mm. So that's for that's that's for sure. And and I would just love to chime in there, Kuba. Um, uh, I think embeddings are really really important in in this space. Of course, you know, well, you know building visual search engines. So what are like, uh, in your opinion, what are like the importance of good and you know, topic relevant embeddings uh, when dealing with uh, visual search um, engine technology? Um, yeah, so so I think this touches a bit on, uh, on what I said before. So okay. about like, uh, that's, it is problem specific, even though uh, you know uh, some very generic, uh, generic search engines. Uh, it might not seem so, but if if we want to build, uh, you know, very very specific solutions, and I think that's how uh, you know this is being used now, right? So, for instance, if we want to have good, um, you know, recommendations for fashion, uh, then we need to focus on on that, and uh, even. Even very very specific on um, uh, on um, you know focusing on a certain even garment type uh, to get it right. The same goes, for instance, in in, in my uh, in, in my work. Like if you would uh, just use uh, a um, you know pre-trained network to do embeddings of uh, cattle uh, faces, uh, then. It just uh, doesn't work at all, right? Because there's no no reason why such network would would ever learn about what distinguishes uh, one cattle from another. And the same goes for uh, human human faces, like the facial fa face ID technology that we have that works, you know, so well now. Um, it only works because it uh, it was trained on a, a billion uh, faces, uh, and. Um, Mm, so that's why it's relevant, right? So it's not like uh, you know you have right. uh, a magic uh, magic way of uh, creating an embedding that will work well in in in, in you know various scenarios. You, you need to control it somehow. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm um, just following up on this real quick. I mean, those are situations where you have labels, right? You're training like on faces, you have the labels. Then how, how there, I think there are quite a number of use cases where you don't have access to labels as much as, you know, as much as you'd want to. So how would you train a very good embedding in such cases where you don't have labels to work with? Yeah, without labels, um... Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. So without labels, uh, of course, you have limited options, right? Um, right. So let's say you you want to, uh, you know, you have a use case that is very uh, very, um, I mean, new to the to compared to the data mm-hmm. to the images normally in the data sets, right? Uh, yeah. uh, that you found. So for instance, uh, I, I don't know something from a factory. Uh, maybe some use case where there's limited amount of data. Then uh, I think the the growing the the current approach, and especially in the growing field of um, you know self supervised um, uh, learning, is uh, is very helpful here. So you can actually improve uh, improve embeddings and train embeddings on uh, in a self supervised way. So essentially, you only need the data, so it can be collected um, and then uh, the networks there are different uh, there are different types of uh, you know ways of how you can um, how they work like how self-supervised learning works it can be mm-hmm. uh, like most intuitively uh, the 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 most intuitive methods um, they are not being used that much anymore but they are I think for explanation purposes they are better so for instance you you train a, learn, a network that fills a gap of an image, right? So you cut out the gap, and then you tell, yeah, what's the what's in the gap? Uh, or you, um, you know, um, you let the network color uh, an image. It's also something that you can self supervise, and then uh, hopefully learn something from it. But the, the newer approach, they use some, um, uh, they use a bit of more elaborate uh, techniques for instance uh you try uh, you essentially work with pairs of images which one is uh, you know malformed a bit with augmentations and then you you try to learn embeddings that are the same for both images that are technically different uh, right and that's very challenging for the network because it has to understand um the content uh, of the image yeah, and training on uh, on such embeddings. Uh, I mean, using such embeddings will for sure uh, improve. Uh, you know, improve improve the uh, the scores or whatever your problem will be. Mm. Yeah, but you know, there are that downsides to that uh, as well. Like, uh, not many people like use it uh, on a large scale. They are usually hard to train. Right, the self supervised uh, networks they. They're not converging there. There's a lot of trickery coming going on with them. And I would say it's kind of like a last resort if you don't. Yeah, and, and it does really seem like a, a tricky problem to solve. So how's like the evaluation process? You know, how do you evaluate like that this particular model you've trained or this particular problem? You, I mean, you're kind of meeting those, those requirements sort of. So you mean like in general, like how... How yeah, how, how you evaluate here, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think like uh, most of the um, uh, most of the situations will be to uh, you know, of course, it depends on whatever problem you have, right? If it's mm-hmm. uh, if it's an uh, like uh, if it's a ranking problem, then of course you have uh, some uh, some ways of uh, you know. Uh, assigning scores to uh, to what, what is happening. So, for instance, I would assume like uh, uh, visual search uh, mm, such as Pinterest or Google Lens, they 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 certainly can label it and can have some uh, some ground truth, right? So because right. they know what was clicked uh, mm, or what the user uh, what the user clicked, in in you know in in fields like um, identification and re-identification, we usually just use like a, you know, top one accuracy essentially is, is the most important uh, factor because like you, it doesn't help if you are, uh, if you're one off essentially in most cases. I mean, it can, it can mm-hmm. be that it, it is okay, uh, but uh, most of the time, mm, 
uh, it is not right. So, uh, yeah, so that would be the um, the important thing. Uh, Lev wants to know, does Jakob think that integrating visual searches like Google Lens with other apps and products in an intuitive way has happened properly yet? Any thoughts? That uh, integrating things like uh, Google Lens and making a product out of it, essentially, like on top of uh, on top of uh, on top of that, I think like a lot of uh, you know a lot of companies uh, definitely try to to improve their this, this kind of like uh, to shop experience, right? So and that that happens for sure a lot in in, in fashion where you can like where there's even like a big a big fashion companies such as uh, ASOS or H&M, they have it in their apps, right? So it's not like even, uh, of course, if they are not in- integrating with uh, with Google Lens, they have some inbuilt solutions for this, this problem, but they have um, uh, solutions for you to, you know, to scan something and uh, query their, um, their inventory, essentially. So um, that's definitely, um, Mm, that's definitely happening and uh it seems like a very valid use case with uh you know high value and monetary value and you have some experience with uh building uh visual search engines for fashion yourself yeah i worked on uh on on some um, some solutions where we tried to mine information from from instagram uh so essentially like building uh an understanding and building uh you know a visual a visual search engine of uh data that we mined from uh, from instagram and that was a very uh very interesting use case because uh you know usually like instagram is non-searchable mm. so you have you can you know you can do basic search like mm, essentially by tags uh, and that's it. And so even even basic text search is not really working. If you want to, you know, search through, you know, millions of or thousands of uh, Instagram profiles, so we mined this data and then ran it through, um, you know, some pipelines that will that could uh, could give uh, that enabled uh, visual search on on top of them. So, for instance, if you would want to query uh, the database with a certain uh, dress, an image of a dress. We would like to see whoever and who uh, posted uh, something that fits this, mm. and that's of course uh, you know important for for various reasons, uh, like uh, you know people that are responsible for for product marketing, for for buying. Uh, for pricing, right? So there's a lot of use cases where, you know, until uh, from social media mm, is important, right? So we do that. We, we do this in other fields, right? Like social social media monitoring mm, is, is a thing since a while. It, it now is also a, mm, you know, social media monitoring when it comes to fashion is also a thing. There are companies doing only that, for instance, like, um yeah so right so what about um when you take visual search to production uh like what to be aware of what what are some common problems and issues that you face there oh definitely one of the big big problem is uh that um you need to be uh aware of the fact that changing uh changing the model is can be quite costly and can be i think a bit more costly than it uh, usually is uh in normal machine learning right because in normal machine learning if you change the model um, let's say that that's recommendations right uh then for future recommendations uh, you use the new model and you don't necessarily have to change it for the past uh, or recalculate it for the past but for visual search you need to uh recalculate every time you you want to use a new model you want to you, you have to recalculate um 
all the stuff for all the images. And imagine that uh, doing this on a big scale might must be a uh, um, I, I don't know how, for instance, Google does it, or for for uh, for uh, for their uh, their engines, how often they are doing it, or if if at all. Like that's very hard for me to 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 tell. But that's definitely something that you need to be aware of. If you change the model, it will change the uh, the embeddings, and um, you you they are they are becoming uncomparable, right? So most of the time, right? So that's that's mm -hmm. that's a critical uh, critical step, and then of course there's this uh, a big issue, and especially in large uh, large scale uh, apps, is the um, kind of the database size. So if you uh, if you are acquiring through uh, you know million pictures, maybe that's not a big deal, but um, acquiring uh, through tens or you know tens of millions might might become a problem and might get uh, expensive quickly so there is like a multi multiple ways of uh, how to narrow it you usually don't need and want to compare uh, against everything like i'm sure if i use google lens uh, there is a special you know filter that they put on me because of what all the information they already know about me that they don't have to scan against all the pictures, you know. Mm. So yeah. So that's uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's that. That's definitely two two things that are uh, super super uh, critical. So we have a a question about this. Uh, a fashion project in chat from uh, Olu Wasun. Uh, could you please explain the processes you used for the deployment of that fashion project using visual search? If you can tell us more. Um, so, um, yeah, so, uh, so roughly, uh, there were to, to, to this problem, there were like two components. So the, the relevant component now is like the indexing kind of part. So what happens that because of course there are like the one part was doing like the, the mining and scraping of data and then ingesting it uh, in, in some databases. And when whenever a new picture came up, um, we actually ran detections uh, to detect the certain uh, garment types on the image because like if you think about a fashion picture on instagram it usually will uh, have you know multiples uh, multiple um, items in it and it's very hard to to get like uh, to build systems that have like this global understanding of fashion like we don't of course there are companies working on it like to recommend you a full uh, outfit or if this item fits this uh, this item but these are this is a bit of a different problem so in our case we we had um, models that were doing detection and segmentation first uh, of all the all the items so the items could be you know pants dresses hats uh, you know um, t-shirts whatever essentially like all the like in the end there are not so many types of garments if you think about it like i think there were like 18 covers like a very uh, very large um, amount of garments so then these were uh, being uh, extracted from the image so you essentially can think of it that one one image gets split into n images and uh, then you need to keep track uh, and keep and keep uh, storing also those um, segmented parts and you also need to store uh, uh, the embeddings for those um, for those uh, you know separate uh, items because you never know how you end up uh, retrieving them maybe you will just run queries against a certain type so for instance if someone will want to find uh, similar dresses in all those pictures, then he will select that I'm looking for dresses and we will only look for embeddings in this um, index so we can narrow it down. Uh, but maybe, uh, maybe, uh, maybe not, maybe there, it will be like a, a, a broader search. So essentially, you know, as you see, like once you, uh, once you, 
you know, my one picture later, it might become actually even more, uh, uh, more data, right. Uh, than this one. And, and that's something to, to be aware of. Right. Uh, but of course there are different strategies to that, to, to that too. Like, um, you could, um, you know, combine embeddings from different, uh, from different things to get like this global, uh, global descriptor of, of, of uh, that is, you know, fashion, uh, fashion hour. But, you know, in, in the end, like this is kind of like a, a process of creating like a data lake, but for images, right? That you can, that you, you don't know yet how you will use it. Uh, you need to be, uh, if you, you, you want easy access to, uh, to it and you don't want to recompute because running segmentation and detection models is actually the, one of the most, you know, um, expensive uh, moment uh, in the pipeline. So you do it once and then you think, uh, you know, uh, think later uh, if that uh, what solutions <laughs> will work. And and still on the still on the fashion industry use case, I think Andres ha- asks a brilliant question here on YouTube. And like from the software engineering point of view, you know, how did you approach the crawling your images from you know Instagram, the different images to build your training set? And what was that process like for you? And um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, mm, so. That that project was done like uh, already quite a while ago, so I'm not sure if that's still valid. So that's right. avatar, but but mm-hmm. I want to um, you know be straight about that because uh, Instagram, of course, is uh, you know doesn't like um, crawling and mining, right? Uh, and they right. will fight you back. Uh, but usually, like the the um, the, um, the simplest approach is just to, to use like a. A pool of um, that's how it's called. I, they are called like HTTP proxies, right? So you can you essentially rent out a service that will proxy your uh, requests um, through different mm-hmm. uh, places in the world. Uh, and from from uh, engineering perspective, that's actually quite easy because um, they give you like one endpoint uh, that you redirect all the traffic through. And uh, uh, usually there are services that uh, do it quite well. So they will, you know, you make one request to this specific user um, and they will redirect this request through uh, a server in, you know, in China or in other, whatever country. And they will keep doing this, like um, keep uh, uh, balancing and keep uh, uh, using different servers. So... That's kind of, kind of works. There's, uh, until like there's a complete closure of, uh, of the API of Instagram. It, I guess that still works, right? I mean, the only thing that is not working is like if there are private accounts that you can't access, um, without logging in, then of course, uh, it will work. But if you need to log in, then yeah, then you have a problem. Like, but we, we came up with uh, our, uh, you know, Intuition was that you know the accounts that uh, you know we want to have data from are open. Right. They are from other companies. They are from big influencers, and they don't want have having the accounts private. Awesome, awesome. I think we have a really good question from the community, which I've also had in mind as well, and that's from Mashid. <laughs> I hope I pronounced your name right, Mashid. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> uh, he asked a really good question. Yeah, like what are the biggest challenges you have in, you know, training models for visual search um, 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 models? Are, are there like some new techniques that you try to combat them with? What do you look out for, you know, in terms of computes, the techniques you use and so forth? Mm, yeah, I see, uh, I see a question. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can like answer this, like, uh, because it's a very, uh, very broad um, question, but. Right. Um, maybe, uh, I think that the most important thing is as usual, like in almost all computer vision and machine learning is the, the data, right? Like getting the data right is usually, uh, the biggest uh, challenge. And I have seen this, but so if, if you mean if by, by data, I mean, like if you are collecting data, then of course that's one problem. And if you don't, if you already have data, then labeling data in the right way, uh, if it's semi-labeling or if it's real labeling by labeling people, 
then this is the critical step that you you really think need to think about much uh, a lot. I mean, because uh, it can uh, be very costly if you do it wrong, and uh, you know, like that's like the the best uh, advice I can give. Because training later on. Uh, Depends which which models we are talking about. So, for instance, triplet uh, and uh, this type of uh, triplet, quadruplet, or um, CME type of networks, they are mm, relatively tricky to train mm, because they have uh, like you have the problems of of, of sampling uh, sampling the triplets in the right way. It kind of grows. Uh, uh, you know, to a very big problem, the more classes you also have in, in the data sets. Uh, uh, but, you know, what they are uh, for big, uh, for very large data sets, that's what you have to use. If you have like decently sized data sets, uh, you know, using the, um, for learning uh, good embeddings, um, the best, the best you can, uh, you can choose from, uh, is essentially the networks that are being used for facial detection, uh, facial um, uh, uh, facial recognition, so face ID, so deep face, arc face, cos face. So they are they are those networks that um, that are trained like a classification network, but <clears throat> but what you uh, but but in the loss function you actually learn um, embeddings that are separating. Uh, 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 separating them by a, a bigger margin uh, than using regular like uh, cross entropy uh, classification. So these work work very really well, and you can see that, um, uh, for instance, by checking uh, the recent uh, landmark identification on uh, competitions on Kaggle, for instance, where um, they are they were also used, and the data sets are enormous uh, in in this competition. So. Uh, and they actually, yeah, and th th this technology that was used for, you know, for facial uh, uh, identification actually got essentially with the same, I mean, the, the, the basis was, uh, was the same. Of course, as usual on Kaggle, there were a mm -hmm. lot of trickery going on uh, on top of that, but the base was uh, mm, facial uh, identification technology applied to this pro to, to problem of landmark matching, right? So you you have like a, something that you know from the from the outside it seems like completely distant problem, but um, you know the solutions are the same and work really well. Really well. And those those uh, arc face, cost face networks they they are actually relatively easy to train. Uh, not as easy as uh, you know um, uh, cross entropy or classification, right. but close to it. So I just have two follow-ups on that, and um, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I'm kind of thinking, how do you sort of select, say, your training architecture in terms of, you know, how you decide you're going to train? Because I assume that you deal with enormous amount of data sets, and then you might think about preloading the data sets in like a GPU, for example, during training so that, you know, you're loading those in batches. So how do you determine, oh, I'm going to be training this, say, on like multiple clusters? Uh, versus just you know what how do you kind of uh when you're dealing with large data sets how do you determine how that training process would would look like mm, yeah i think like here uh you know the the limitation uh when it comes to training and this uh, problem is the um, mm, especially when uh when we talk about this arc phase or mm -hmm. classification like network is that right. that in the end uh, the amount of labels, um, you know, that you have. So let's say you have 1 million uh, IDs or people or landmarks in your data set. So that means that uh, your uh, uh, your less layers uh, are getting really big uh, in the network. Right. And there is not very much you can do about it. Um, if they don't fit in one uh, model, then you do model, uh, you know, you split model on, on, on multiple devices and you still keep training it. And that's mm -hmm. what people do uh, if they have to, uh, to, um, to train on, on millions of IDs, which is, which is already quite, uh, quite significant, um, I would say. Mm, but the other networks, like if you, uh, if you, want to go more in this you know met metric learning approach with training with triplets then there is no limitations i mean the, the biggest limitation will be the batch size then which mm -hmm. you know you can 
it doesn't have to be uh, crazy big, but you are not having such a big model, and that's more important. Right. Uh, so, yeah, we have a few questions from the community, but uh, I would just love to ask: Are there like common transformation methods? You know, you you use a lot more than others in the space when you're running those transformation at scale. The transformations uh, in, in, in in what, what in, sense? in terms of like your data augmentation processes uh, and so forth. Yeah, I don't think there's uh, I don't think there's really um, mm, a rule for that. I think okay. mm -hmm. now now nowadays uh, what we what you see definitely um, shining and when it comes to uh, uh, for instance Kaggle and uh, in my experience also is that those uh, cutout uh, methods got more attention than they ever did. Um, mm -hmm. They are also quite new, so essentially like cutting out um, parts of the images, and they are being used um, used uh, used quite a lot. But all, right. other than that, augmentation is always a case of the data you have, right? So, for instance, Pretty much. Uh, yeah, for instance, for animal pictures that I use, uh, I need to be very careful about what mm -hmm. what 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 doesn't make sense and what uh, transformation makes sense. And if you have huge amounts of data, then you also, you know, you can use less, uh, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. augmentation like for instance for this landmark if you, if anyone is interested in whatever new is going on i think uh, in, in 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 visual search and matching then those competitions are really a good resource to learn uh, and you see that um, the augmentation and in, in the last visual landmark matching competition was very small like they used very basic uh, and very uh, in very low degree uh, so to say augmentations Right, right. Uh, we have uh, Chimaobi and Ak building, uh, asking about building an image validation system for an online marketplace platform. Ah, validation in the sense of like, can we can we use this image and post it uh, and post the uh, and make the posting on this uh, on this uh, platform, for instance? That would be uh, a case or. I'm not sure if I uh, I want to understand the, the problem. So maybe uh, there was a mention of n number of product categories. Um, maybe we can get some. Ah, so maybe image matching in a sense that and that and that it's like classifying like an image into n categories based on just the visual uh, visuals of it. That could be. Um, so may, maybe so if it's a market, so I will try to like figure it out uh, what this problem might be. So what I see as a problem in a, in a marketplace, like that you let's say eBay or whatever, and you have uh, and you have the the problem that you might face there is that the number of categories is not constant, right? So that 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 is a valid problem because if it uh, if it's not uh, constant that means that um, uh, that means that you can't just use simple classification right because otherwise like I would say like okay I'm selling a, a ball it gets classified as a ball and then then it helps in some UI right so in case of uh, uh, of a new category you wouldn't have you wouldn't support it right away and if you uh, use like any metric learning or similarity approach, what you could do is that you, you would need only one instance of uh, of a new category. So when someone adds something, he didn't find the category, but he uh, put in what the valid category or someone who manages the, the the website did it, and then we have one image that is uh, that is uh, associated with a new category, and that that's a typical problem of one one shot learning, and then. We could do this with good embeddings, right? Uh, so instead of doing this as a classification problem, uh, we, what we would do is that we would, in the future, compare a new picture with uh, with images from all the categories and choose the closest one, and then you have uh, solved the problem of uh, um, of a changing number of categories. That's that's what I that, that's the problem I see in the marketplace. But maybe this person can 
elaborate if that's what uh, what what they meant. Yeah, we have the person with us here in the call. All right. So what I'm asking is, um, you have just like Amazon, people upload pictures of their products, what they sell yeah. online. Now, you know, some people might make a mistake of um, maybe they want to upload um, a laptop and then they are calling, they are naming the laptop a pencil, which is misleading. Now, how do we validate these uploads knowing that there are n number of products? We don't know what particular mm. product this person might be uploading at a particular time. Doesn't mean we have to keep downloading products, categories, uh, just to build a model like that. Okay, so how I understand is that the, the problem uh, is said that you a user makes a mistake by uh, by selecting a category and then the picture is not uh, reflecting this category. Is this is this this the, the situation? You you are you are muted. Yeah. This is the yes, situation. Yes. So essentially yes. but, but now you know yeah, but now you know here the categories our products are too many. Uh, so building uh, a machine learning model for this uh, doesn't mean we have to download um, all kinds of uh, images for this uh, uh, for our validation for training our model. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what I mean. Hmm. So, so if I'm uh, if I'm yeah, I'm trying to figure out if if uh, if I get the if I get the problem. So. In a in a situation that, what what do you mean by by down downloading? Uh, I mean, because that, that seems to me like this is a, either a classification problem or a or a comparison, so similarity problem. So either either one could validate the input against a category, right? If you have um, the uh, uh, the models trained for that task, so I'm not sure if. Uh, Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if uh, if I if I get this uh, this question. Maybe, maybe maybe there's someone who uh, uh, who has a take on that. Like uh, maybe someone understood this differently, uh, or and can. Um... Is it maybe a question of how to go about building the the data the data set that you would need for for training the models in the first place and validating. I'm sure. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So, um, are we going to download? Uh, are we going to acquire data of different categories? Maybe that tomorrow somebody might just come up and upload uh, a category that is not in maybe in our data, like uh, a, a, a particular product that was not trained. Our model wasn't trained on. Um, that's what I'm asking. How do we now validate this? Is there a way to train a model? So, yes. mm, I mean, so I, I think that 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 what what I said before is still uh, kind of valid for 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 this. Uh, so, in the end, uh, for a fixed number of uh, classes, you you can work with a classification for for a number of for classes that are not fixed. So, essentially, categories in your uh, situation, then uh, you would essentially figure out the embeddings for for this new image and you would see that uh, uh, that it doesn't fit any of the categories uh, pretty well uh, and or the distance would be uh, by would be would be far by a, a large margin and then you could uh, maybe uh, make the call that hey maybe that's maybe that's uh, maybe there's no match between uh, this category and um and uh, this, uh, you know, image. Mm, so that that would be, uh, I think, the, uh, a valid valid approach uh, for that. All right. There is also a possibility of following up uh, later in the MLOps community Slack. There is a channel for computer vision there where you can also uh, discuss this later on. So thank you for the question and thanks, Kuba.
just as we are looking to to wrap this up, Ankuba, are there like current say landscape for you know vector similarity tools and solutions uh, that you know we should look out for? And then you know what's the what's the research angle? How's how's research going on in that area currently? Yeah, I mean there are like uh, for for vector similarity, uh, there's a bunch of solutions now. Um, mm-hmm varying from you know some of them being um, you know paid some free open source uh, they all have some you know quirks uh, uh, to it uh, but uh, some of them are built on top of um, on top of you know already existing databases and uh, and I think like the t- I, what I would uh, you know recommend for ev- anyone starting in this is that um, you know if you're not uh, if you're not you know, reaching like some gigantic scale, so like a million plus uh, vectors that you need to search through. I think those uh, solutions that use uh, a database that you already have, most likely, so for instance, Postgres, there's definitely an engine built on po- on Postgres. There's There are engines built on, they are not official, of course, but they are like um, services that are using um, you know, some database as a, the, the persistent uh, layer. And I would use them uh, if, if if it fits what you have already in the stack, right? Because it's always nice to have those embeddings um, uh, stored in, in a place that, he, you know, mm-hmm. that, is, that, that other data is because it will give you more, uh, you know, options to uh, for querying. And if you have like really big uh, and you know that you will go big, then you can, you can buy um, managed services for that and uh, pay for, pay, then, then you need to pay for each index. Um, mm, so for each, uh, usually for each index uh, and for the amount it takes um, in memory, because most of them will be running from RAM, right? So right. You, you need big instances uh, for, you know, big uh, indexes. And and the build, the build versus buy solution is, you know, one of the talking points in the in the ML and, you know, software uh, industry as well. And uh, just talking about your, your day-to-day workflow, you know, what's like the basic tool stack you use? You know, what's like, how, how does that, the technologies you use to, when working with, um, one building visual search engines. What's like your tool stack? What's your tool stack like? Mm, yeah, so I use uh, Python, okay. PyTorch, and uh, for for similarity, um, I tried. I think I tried m- m- like most of the the big uh, the big um, providers now. Um, so Milvus is quite uh, quite nice from the managed um, managed solutions. Uh, Pinecone is uh, is also quite uh, quite a good uh, a good choice. So and yeah, besides that, uh, for 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 day to day stuff, um, um, Python and PyTorch, face fast API uh, builds most of the of the stuff I uh, I'm currently uh, currently building. Um, so yeah, and, and I think another issue that that's regularly discussed as well is uh, you know thinking about building stuff that scale to whatever problem we are solving. Uh, in terms of moving from that approach of building a baseline um, system that works to something that scales to see a lot of users, for example, maybe not Google scale or you know Yahoo, um, Bing scale or things like that, but something that works for uh, our users. How do you move from, how do you transition from just building like that proof of concept to something that scales? You know, how do you make that transition? Or what should you know while making that transition? (laughs) Yeah, I think like uh, a proof of concept uh, would be an, uh, uh, I would say like, uh, let's assume that uh, for the proof of concept mm-hmm. can be, uh, you know, a simple thing that you hack together in, in a Jupyter notebook and your right. index of embeddings is actually in memory in NumPy and you just do a dot product uh, <laughs> with the query and that's it. And mm-hmm. uh, that's, that can be your very, very much baseline um situation and then whenever you move then you need to think about like uh things like uh you know how how will you start working on the mm, uh, on the on the models uh itself how 
you need to keep thinking about, you know, persisting and updating uh, embeddings, right? So when, whenever right. you ship a new model, you need to keep, you need to slowly, uh, you know, automate the, the pipelines that you have. And of course, if you reach like a very big scale, then then you need to think about uh, all the scalability issues of this problem, which is uh, usually, um, I would say, maybe not a big problem is understatement okay. but there's there's solutions that help you with that right so mm -hmm. mm, either managed or not but uh or you, you so for instance if you there are there are, uh, there are you know uh, vector search engines that you can just deploy uh, in as a helm chart and you are ready to okay. go almost right and you have your own so uh, you know um service to integrate with and that's of course uh, one way of of doing it, right? Um, but yeah, mm, I think uh, the scale of, of the query size is, or, right. or, or of your data sets is probably even more important because it will, will it will you know uh, determine how much you need to re uh, recalculate everything and how often, mm, which is right. right. I, I think we we of course running out of time, but this is a. Uh... A really good conversation. I think you can continue in the uh, in the MLOps community. So, um, um, listeners, viewers, if you're not yet, if you've not yet joined the MLOps community, you know, please check the show notes or you know, check the chats uh, right here. But I think it's good, Sabine. Yeah, we'll be wrapping up here today. So no worries if you didn't get your question answered. You can always reach us, uh, reach out to us in uh, Slack, in the Computer Vision channel, or in the Neptune AI channel. But thank you very much to everyone who asked questions, and thank you very much, Jakub, for joining us and uh, answering all our burning uh, visual search questions. Sure did. <laughs> <laughs> so we will be back in two weeks with our next episode of MLOps Live. We will be having Jacopo Taliabue on to discuss all things reasonable scale MLOps in, in two weeks. So hopefully we will see you then. Thanks again very much to everyone. Take care. Thanks. Bye. All right. Thanks. See you in a couple of weeks. Bye bye. MLOps Live is brought to you by Neptune AI. Remember that you can join us live at the next event and ask your questions. We run it every other Wednesday and you can register at neptune.ai slash events. And then make sure to search for MLOps Live in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere you get your podcast. Click follow and don't miss any episodes. Thanks and see you next time. Yeah.